Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, April 30th. Today's topic is project-based learning and STEM. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Patty Ruffing was going to do the introduction today, but she's not here, so I think I will do the introduction. Or I saw a hand go up and then go down again. Our special guest today is Mike Gorman, and his topic is project-based learning and STEM. Mike is a teacher, a speaker, a consultant, a facilitator, an advisor, an advocate, and a blogger. He has won numerous awards, including Southwest Allen County Schools Teacher of the Year, State of Indiana Semifinalist Teacher of the Year, U.S. Air Force Association Indiana STEM Educator of the Year, and Fort Wayne Education Innovator of the Year. He's got an award-winning blog, uh, which focuses on 21st century skills. STEM, project-based learning, educational reform, and technology integration, student-centered learning with a view to our futures at the heart of what, what Mike advocates for every day. So I will ask the newbie question here. What are the differences between project-based learning, problem-based learning, inquiry-based learning, and discovery learning. Good morning. Um, thank you, Laurie. First of all, I'm hoping if you can't hear me, go ahead and hit in that chat window and let me know, but I think I should be coming through pretty good. What an awesome question. Uh, what are the differences between? Um, we could actually, we could do another webinar on this one if you want. Um, uh, one of the biggest things, I, I would actually put them all into the area of what I would call inquiry-based learning. And now we have different realms of this. Project, I think, is almost the most open. It's a very open-ended thing. There isn't necessarily a problem based in it, but it, it could be anything that kids want to explore. I always say, tell people, don't make sure you're covering the content standards, all those types of things. Problem, a lot of times a little more defined, um, sometimes a little more useful, especially in the math area where you don't have the time to go off too much and you're having to kind of hit those content standards constantly. Inquiry is, again, just the approach we use to the learning, and that can happen under um, project-based learning or problem-based learning, or you could put inquiry over a big heading and then put those two under it. And the discovery learning is, again, is that same thing of inquiry. I'm discovering to learn. I'm looking. Um, a lot of times we talk about the five E's in education, that type of thing. And so a lot of times we will say that before we explain something to kids, let's let them inquire. Let's, them, let's let them discover first. So that's my best attempt at a 60-second answer. Does that work for you, Lori? Yes, that's fine, Mike. You can go ahead and begin your presentation. Thank you. Well, well hey, it's great to be with everybody today. Thank you for jo thanks first of all for taking a Saturday. Um, we've got people from across the country and across the world, so that's that's always great to see. I'm excited to be here with you. Um, my name is Mike Gorman, and again, uh, here's my Twitter, here's my blog. Um, my email, and I will let you know that everything we do, I'm going to go pretty quick because there's a lot of information, but everything I have is there for you on that live binder page. So what I'd really like you to do is instead of worrying about taking notes, use the live binder for that, and instead go ahead and jump in the conversation. Use your chat window. Um, you might know of some things that some of us have never heard of. I think the neatest thing about something like this is that collaboratively um, we all work together. You know, it's, it's that whole idea that the crowd's a lot um, more um, powerful than any one individual. So please use that, do that. I'm actually in. I'm from Fort Wayne, Indiana. Started a one-to-one -one program here in Fort Wayne. Um, actually doing the broadcast right now up in the Michigan area. So. Um, 
But if you've ever heard of Fort Wayne, just north of Indianapolis, um, probably the one thing that people may know out of Fort Wayne is if you're familiar with Vera Bradley, that's the corporate headquarters. So uh, you may have heard them. Usually you'll see those in every airport. Um, again, some of the people that I work with across the country um, doing my consulting and, and working with different types of groups. One of them, especially as we talk about the STEM areas, I like to emphasize discovery education because they do some great things as far as that. And as I talk about the PDL, if you've ever heard of the Buck Institute, um, BIE has some great things um, out of Nevada, California. And so I'll be kind of referencing some of those um, different types of, of um, groups that I do work with. It's an honor and a privilege to present here at Classroom 2.0. Thank you so much for having me. And I want to thank everybody who's in the room to take that hour out of their time in the middle of a Saturday or whatever day it is or whatever time it is. Um, it's just a privilege to be with all of you. And again, keep that chat window going. Please go ahead. I, the one thing that I love to see is as busy a chat window as possible. Um, you give your ideas, any comments, anything like that. And today's deliverables, first of all, is going to be your quick win sheet. And I call the quick win sheet your live binder. Make sure you use that live binder. It has all the information we're going to be talking about plus more. Also, you can hit my website, and you've seen that. In fact, it's right now in the chat window right now. All of these things are on the chat on the website plus more. And I guarantee if you get to that website, you'll experience a lot of neat things. I want to honor um, the practice of everybody in here. And if, if you would just throw into the chat room, it's kind of interesting to find out how many years of teaching experience do we have out there. And as, as, as we talk about these years of teaching experience, I'll talk about mine. Mine was 38 years in the classroom and central office. Now, I got that 17 in front of me because that counts also that time I spent in school get my educational experience. But, you know, I go back to some of those, uh, if you look at it, how, I, I think some of you may have gotten one of these for graduation. They were called the typewriter. Um, and, of course, with that, we got our liquid paper. I asked a student, I told students about this recently. We used to have this liquid paper. One of them looked at me and said, yeah, well, how did you clean the screen with that? Um, of course, when we first went on the Internet, we actually used to have that, that Internet mating call, we used to call it, and we used this, this thing called the modem. And, of course, we ended up putting our phone into it, much different than the um, telephone um, of, to, of today, the cell phone of today. Who remembers talking to the ceiling? Okay, remember the intercom would come over and you would sit there and you would talk to the ceiling. And if you were alone in the room, you always look kind of weird with that. My first cell phone. Anybody have one of these? The bag phone. And, of course, this was my very first PowerPoint. It was before the computer was ever invented, but we would take slides. We would sync it with a cassette tape player, and we actually had a PowerPoint presentation. My emphasis is not all of this is new. Some of you remember the film strip projector. Remember, that was the thing. You turned it on the beeps. Um, the only one awake in the classroom was the one who had to turn it on the peeps, by the way. Um, 16 millimeter projector, okay? Um, in fact, I still remember if we were really good in class, the teacher would show the film backwards, kind of that first look at um, backwards by design. Who remembers this? And every time I tell teachers about this one, the first thing they want to say is, Oh, what did the kids do with those papers once they got them? And usually it was a nice whiff of the paper, if you remember that. Um, of course, some of our first computers, okay, we had um, some of these types of, um, this was the TRS-80, of course, the Mac. Some of you remember this. Um, of course, we got better as we got color computers and um, the Apple IIe. Who remembers their first video game? Here was mine. It was Pong. Okay, and I still remember Pong, um, black and white, not a whole lot of graphics. And, of course, who can't forget this one, Oregon Trail. It's amazing when I think of Oregon Trail. Um, it was one of those first interactives or whatever that we actually had a class, you know, we, we used in class, and the kids were so excited. Um, Jane, you're right. Yeah, we've come a long, long, long way. Um, and so... Yes, I was hooked on Oregon Trail, too, and most of the time I got there, and most of the time I got there with 
everything that I needed. Hey, the reason I bring this up is so many times we hear all of these different things about our past practices, and we, we talk about how, oh, we have STEM, we have PBL. And, and the first thing I want to do is honor all of you people that to say a lot of us have been doing a lot of these things all along. Okay, and I think that's the biggest thing we can do for teachers in, in our country and in the world is to say, wow, we've had amazing teachers. We've always had amazing teachers. So I want to take this past practice idea and I want to, I want to, I want to just go forward with it, do some, some definitions, some whatevers that maybe bring us even further along in this type of thing. So I've got a STEM journal I'm going to be going through. And the STEM journal, first of all, let's talk about STEM, project-based learning, and technology. That'll be our first thing. And please, as you are on that chat window, as you see some things, please jump in there, okay? Um, love to hear from you. It just excites me to see what comments people have to say um, all over. Go ahead and throw in one of your favorite past practices. I don't know if any of you, I'll, I'll throw another one. I don't know if any of you remember classrooms with no walls, okay? That was back in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, it, and you're right, Peggy, you said we did project-based learning before they even called it that. You're right. You know, when you think about it, and we'll talk about this, John Dewey was somebody who was doing PBL back before we do. In fact, that's why I have John there. We've got PBL, STEM, and technology integration. And I want to talk about why those three are there. Because sometimes people get a little bit confused on this, but um, STEM is the content, okay? It's... And one of the things I like to really hit with people is don't get lost in just the STEM. I don't believe you can have a good STEM program if you're not bringing in language arts, if you're not bringing in social studies, if you're not bringing in art, okay? Music, all of these things relate with STEM, which is why you see this whole movement towards STEAM. I think they all interrelate, but it's the content areas and it's the mixing of the content areas. Now, as we keep on going on, technology I look at as the connector, okay? Um, and Melanie, you're right, the humanities are so important as part of all that. But technology is the connector. We've always been able to do PBL. We didn't have to have technology to do it. But the things we could do now would be, I always tell people, imagine what Dewey would do today. Okay, with the technology we have. And then last, I think where a lot of STEM programs have some problems is we forget that there's a process involved. And I believe that PBL is the process. So we really have STEM as the content, PBL as the process, and technology is what really, really, really kind of amplifies it and brings it all together. What is STEM to you? Go ahead and, or you could say what PBL is to you. Go ahead and share a little bit of that in the chat window, and I'm going to keep on going. Remember I said PBL is the process? Well, the first thing people will say to me a lot of times is, well, what is project-based learning? My answer, project-based learning is project-based learning. It is project-based learning. It's learning through the use of the project, okay? Um, it really does. David points out here that it makes our learning engaging and relevant, and that is so true. The project teaches. It's not the final encore. The people at BIE at Buck like to say it's not the dessert. It's the main course, okay? And so something to keep in mind as far as that. It's the entire play, okay? It is, it is the opposite of putting it backwards, LBP, which means learn before projects. You don't teach, 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 and then um, suddenly do a project in the end. So um, I, I love what Reba says here. PBL is getting our students to start thinking through solving problems, creating solutions, and finding resources. That is so, so true. And... Um, so let's keep on going on this. This is one of my favorite quotes, and let's just take a second to look at this. It, John Dewey said, give the pupil something to do, not something to learn, and the doing is of such a nature as to demand thinking. Now, that's huge. That's why I have it in bold. The doing is of such a nature as to demand thinking. And it's really the thinking that makes the learning happen. 
It's the metacognition. And so now learning naturally results. Okay? And so I could actually, I actually do a little keynote where I just, we spend the whole keynote on this quote. I could talk for, and listen to people talk about this for hours because it's so simple. It's the doing, but it's the thinking we do because of the doing. So um, go ahead. Anything you think as, as, as you think about that quote, feel free to put in there. Um, what does it mean to you? What are your thoughts on that? And as you do that, I'm going to look at a couple different models of PBL, project-based learning. And one of them came out of the East Coast back in 1997. It was called the six A's of project design. And it included these things, authenticity, academic rigor, applied learning, active exploration, adult relationships, and assessments. Now, I have got links to all of these studies in the live binder. So you, you can kind of take a look at it. I talk about them. But then out at, over at um, Edutopia and through a project with Purdue University, they came up with five keys to rigorous PBL, real world connections, core to learning, structured collaboration, student driven, multifaceted assessment. Sounds an awful lot like the six A's. And now we can keep on going and um, one of the groups that I work with, the Buck Institute, likes to say it's these eight essentials. Last summer, they upgraded these to the gold standards. And when they upgraded to the gold standards, the one I, I could talk a whole um, seminar on the differences between the eight essentials and the gold, but the biggest thing I will say that BIE did is they brought in the idea of authenticity and they brought in the idea heavier of reflection because it's the reflection that causes that metacognition, okay? And so as we get into that, this is, this is kind of what BIE says, and we've kind of thrown the gold standards in there, but I encourage you to um, go to, in fact, Peggy, thanks, she just threw that in um, on the gold standards. It's a great article from the Buck Institute. Remember, what I'm talking about is PBL is the process. Okay, and that's what's so important. Now, what are, what are these eight essentials as we get into PBL? Well, one of the first things is the significant content. And as you can see there below, when we talk about STEM, it's these. But remember, I've already told you, don't forget the other areas. Okay, STEM is the content. Don't get that messed up with the process. Now, a pure STEM person will actually say it's this process, and I agree with them. But a lot of times in schools, we go and we say, we're going to do STEM. And so people start doing all these STEM, and I call them activities, and they really miss the process because they're missing some of the content. It's just a bunch of cool, fun activities. But as we start thinking about what process we're using to de deliver the STEM, then we put STEM into the actual content area, and we can put something else into the process. So STEM content, we've talked about these ideas. And there's all types of things of STEM. I have seen STEM. I have seen STEAM. I have seen R put into STEM for STREAM. I've, in, I've even seen STREAMY include everybody. And of course, if you're going to have STREAMY, you better have streamier and streamiest. I haven't seen those yet, but I bet you somebody's going to come up on one of these times. Okay? Now, the essential elements of PBL is life and success skills. We bring the four C's competencies together. And really what BIE is doing now in, in their, their talks is they're really no longer calling them the 21st century skills. They're calling them life and success skills because there's so much more there than just the four C's. But you see, PBL provides that foundation. Okay? And so on the one side of the track, we see with this train, we see the actual content. On the other side of the track, or the second track, we see these life skills. You have to have both. If you don't have both, the train doesn't run. I've seen a lot of great classrooms that are filled with 21st century skills, and the kids are amazing, and they're doing awesome things, but then you ask them some of the content, and they look at you like, oh, we haven't really talked about that. So it's just something to think about. Um, and Melanie says here, I battle standardized testing learning behavior all the time. You're right. And that's why I say I think we have to make sure our content is in this. And I think the standardized testing will then take care of itself. Now, another element of PBL is in-depth inquiry, letting kids ask questions. And that's actually a convergent to divergent process. 
Okay, we, we get an answer. Now once we get an answer, we go out with new questions. And um, I, again, I could do a whole session just on talking about the whole inquiry process, um, but we want to provide directions to answering problems of the future. And inquiry is a natural part of the STEM disciplines. Now the other thing in PBL we have is the driving question. It's the question that starts the project, and it's kid-friendly, okay? Um, it's not an essential question. I always say essential questions are written for teachers, okay? And so a driving question is aligned with goals, it's engaging and student-centered, it's open-ended, um, and it launches the inquiry. Be careful, and I have in the live binder my whole article I wrote on education ease translated. In other words, we have to make sure that our driving questions are not education ease. So keep that in mind. Here's an example, and I'd love to show this example. That top question there, describe a typical food chain for the herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores in the deciduous forest biome. I call that an essential question, because if I were to pose that to a bunch of third and fourth graders, they're going to look at me and go, what's the question? Because they don't even know the vocabulary. But what if instead I said, can we write a restaurant storybook menu for the animals that live in the forest? Now suddenly, I can uncover the curriculum of what herbivores are, carnivores are, and omnivores are. And so something to think about is, is, is we start thinking about how we do these things. Because with that driving question, then the kids get the needs to know. Well, who eats who in the forest? Well, you mean not everybody eats plants? And you start getting this type of exploration going with kids needing to know. They're uncovering the standards, asking questions in a new way. Um, why are we doing this today? And then I think the biggest thing is giving our kids voice and choice and STEM allows us to do that. PBL allows us to do it. So we use the content of STEM. We use voice and choice as the process. And, and to be honest, I know a lot of you people have studied the SAMR model. When you get up to the very top of SAMR, I really feel that giving, it, it almost requires student voice and choice. Okay? And that's why our PBL really works good at taking us up to those upper realms. It provides that engagement. Okay? Um, individuals and group decision making. Critique and revision, I call it the iterative process, and a lot of people do too, but this whole iterative process is we, we actually introduce a task, we do a skill, and we get stuck in this circle. And that circles the iterative process as we're finding answers. Now in the end, we're finally kicked out of the circle with success, but it's that that circle that we're in, that iterative process, that really, really, really provides important metacognition that if we go back to Dewey's quote, okay, the thinking about the learning, well, right here you're looking at a picture of thinking about the learning. So critique and re revision allows us to build, rebuild, tinker, dream, mix, remix, okay, and, and the last thing uh, at least of the eight that BIE talked about was the public audience and products. Students' demonstrations are an essential part, and we have to let our kids put things um, actually in, uh, in an authentic way. It has to go beyond the refrigerator at home. It has to go beyond the teacher's grade book and things like that. It has to get out into the school, the community, the country, the world. We don't, a lot of times in PBL, people say, well, I have to invite somebody in to be a panel to listen to kids' presentations. That's nice, but how about having your kids make a web page that goes out to the world, listening to other people's comments from the world? How about making um, a mentor come into the classroom, and that's the public audience kids are getting. It, it's more than just somebody just listening to what the kids have done. Um, it could be that kids have created a, um, a literacy program, and they've posted posters uh, across the town, talked to restaurants about putting it on their menus and things like that. So it's more than just an audience listens. And it's when kids have this audience, and again, now we're going to that top of SAMR again, we have this difference in rigor, motivation, and engagement, because now kids realize why they're doing it, and they're excited. Now remember I said with the gold standards, they brought in authenticity. 
and, and, and I always bring in my picture of the cat and the mouse. I mean, we can, we can give him his little toy mouse, but we really know what he's thinking, okay? And authenticity provides real-world purpose, relevance to the here and now, audience and mentors. And um, I always called it the A. I'm actually in the middle of writing an article. It's called the A through G of STEM BL, STEM with PBL. And A is my number one thing. I don't have them all in the publishing forms yet, but as we look at this, that's one of them. And then also essential elements of PBL, the meta reflection and metacognition. This goes back to that Dewey quote. We don't learn until we thought about it. And um, unfortunately, what happens is our society and our state departments of education has turned us into, into standards pushers instead of people that make kids think about the standards and really understand them. We push them long enough so they'll remember them for the test. So it's something to think about there. I'm going to go back to John Dewey. Give people something to do, not something to learn, and the doing is of such a nature as to demand thinking. Learning naturally results. That's the PBL part of STEM, okay? And I think that is so, so, so important. So now we have the process and the content. That's the PBL and the STEM. Well, let's bring in that we know that PBL connects STEM. In other words, PBL allows us to put all of these STEM subjects together if we wish to, okay? And so as we go into here, how do we make it happen? Well, today we have technology. And I tell people that technology is the amplifier. It's the conduit. It's the three that make it together, which you see my triangle down there of why I feel the three really work together. Now, technology blending, it provides the necessary conduit to the real world. Now, keep this in mind. Remember I said I'm working on my A through B G bottle. Here's my B end of it. Blended in technology, and here's the mistakes schools are making today right now. If you look at the four points, let me hit this first point, analog tools. There is nothing wrong with a crayon. There is nothing wrong with a marker. There's nothing wrong with a piece of cardboard. These are pieces of technology. Don't get wound up constantly in making sure that everything has to be digital. Okay, I think that's the mistake we're making a lot of times is we're so afraid that things have to be digital, has to be, we have to have the computers out. We, no, um, think about your first smell of a crayon and think about the imagination that brings to us. So don't think of technology always as digital. Let's go back to analog. It's really okay, okay? And so keep on thinking about that. But then we can get into the actual digital. That's where we bring in SAMR, okay? The redefinition, the modification, and of course, the augmentation and the substitution, okay? All of these types of things which bring us into SAMR. But then how about even going beyond that? There are so many things beyond SAMR and beyond these things, such as um, the pre-analog, remember, cardboard challenge. Has anybody here seen Kane's Arcade? Go ahead and let me know in that chat room. But I don't know how many of you have ever given a three- or four-year-old a, a present, and you find out they play with the cardboard more than the actual um, project. And so this is a great example of this analog idea of keeping that going. And of course, how about beyond our digital tools? It's not about the digital device. Um, don't put your devices in the center of the classroom. Put your kids in the center of the classroom. And the digital tools take us beyond the device. And so we can actually have robotics. We can have electric circuits, squishy circuits, all of these types of things. And we'll talk about that here in just a second as we get into the resources. Um, PDL, STEM, technology integration. I think they all come together. And if you go into Live Finder, you will find an article I did, I did write on that that you're more than welcome to share with other people. Now, what are some of the STEM resources? And I'm going to go through these kind of quick. We've got about, oh, 20, 22 minutes left here. And I'm going to try to hit them starting off with a little bit of science. Okay, and all of these are in the Live Finder for you. So as we start with some of the science ideas, one of my favorites, and if you've got a favorite and it doesn't show up, please put it in the, um, the window. Even if it does show up, put it in the window, and all it does is validate what I'm showing you. But ScienceNet links, 
has got some great ideas, and I've just pulled you one of their, their pages that they use here, but Science Net Links, some great things, a lot of literacy brought into Science Net Links. PATT, some of you probably use out of Colorado, and it's actually interactive simulations that kids go through, and I've seen, seen this used in physics classes, biology classes, um, all of these types of things. Oh, I love that blanket forts to encourage creativity. Thank you, Melanie. Um, the NSDL, National Science Digital Library, has some great things for kids to look at um, and for teachers to find lesson plans in that have to do all to do with science. How science really works. This really brings the real world into things. It's out of Berkeley University. Um, they've got a, a resource library. They have items for teachers. Some really good things here. The New York Hall of Science. Um, some wonderful programs and some wonderful online activities you might want to take a look at. Remember that MIT and Khan have recently in the last year teamed up together and there's actually a science area on the Khan Academy. And one of the things I really want to let you know is they've got some great videos that show kids complicated things explained in a simplified manner by MIT students, some great things with MIT and cons working together. The Howard Hughes Medical Institute, a lot of things if you're into bio-interactive, um, some great things that you might want to take a look at there. Click to Science is another one that has some great opportunities for lesson plans, for resources, all of that type of thing. NASA STEM Wavelength. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of resources you might want to take a look at. Now let's take a look at the technology end of STEM. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are doing code at code.org. If any of you have a really, really good coding program, feel free to throw that in our chat as we go along here. Computer science unplugged. And what it is is it's computer science, but they don't use a computer. Okay. Um, kind of a different angle on that. Yeah, I love the Franklin Institute Science Museum. Thank you very much, Lori. Um, Scratch. How many Scratch users out there? It's free. It's from MIT. You give kids Scratch, and one of the things sometimes teachers will say to me is, oh, I don't know if I can keep up with it and keep showing them what they need to know. Don't worry about it. Let the kids go with it. They'll, you don't need to have them keep up with things. Tinker's another one. If you just want to, if you're getting into some 3D printing and you want to make some, getting kids into some drafting skills, some 3D skills, bringing in the math, all this type of stuff, Tinker, a great program with great tutorials. Acceleration Nation is actually out of the NASCAR um, venue and some great things that kids can learn from them. The National Video Game Challenge actually allow, asks kids to code and create a video game. Now, as we get into our engineering part, one of my favorite goes out to PBS Design Squad Nation. And what I like that this Design Squad Nation does is it not only has kids go through the projects and the games and the videos, but it encourages them to blog about it. What a great way to bring in some of these types of ideas that kids are blogging also. Engineering Your Life all about real life engineering for kids. Teach engineering, um, just tons of resources in all different types of subject areas on engineering itself. Discover engineering, how about having your kids build a skateboard park or design one or a roller coaster? Great things there with, um, with that one. Here, if, if you don't do any, and I'd love to know if anybody has been to this one, I tell people all over the country that this is my favorite STEM site. It's called EGFI. And if you go to it, make sure you hit that for teachers area and sign up for their newsletter. Some great things in there. You'll get this newsletter every week filled with all these neat projects and STEM ideas coming to you. If there's no other link you go to that I've shown you, try that one. Engineering is Elementary came out of, um, I believe that was out of um, Boston Museum. Some great things, especially in the engineering area. And then last, I know I've got some math people on here, but the math site out of Berkeley. Some great things at getting kids to see math in some different ways. Emergent math. This is a blog, but the blog talks about, instead of math as an equation language, math as a true language. 
which I think sometimes we have to really teach our kids the language of math, not the language of equations. Exploring space through math, which is out of NASA, has some great things. Annenberg Learner, here is a great one. You want your kids getting some high-level thinking, some cognitive thinking going on. You will find some great things with Annenberg Learner. Figure this, it's actually just a problem a day that kids can get that they then go out and try to do some real life things with math. Mathematical moments, it's where we're looking at our world and seeing math in our world and um, some wonderful things that they have. MIT Blossoms, this is for higher level. And what it is is they take um, professors from MIT and you actually team teach with them using their videos as the team teaching type thing of explaining some higher level things. I would especially say some of this um, um, through MIT. Get the math. Now this takes us more into junior high and upper elementary of showing kids all the different math and music, um, math in everyday um, pop culture. So some great things. And then I love Math Delicious. Part of it's free. Part of it is, is paid, but some great problem-based learning lessons in the area of math, some things I know that you'll like. And of course, I'm not talking about TED here. I'm talking about TED Ed. TED Ed has some wonderful, wonderful um, lessons that you can actually use with kids that you could put into your LMS that can be used um, in just some great ways, um, very creative. How to smile. Some great science and math has some great things. And thanks, I'm watching the chat window there. Some of you are sharing some great things. Now, the other thing I like to tell people, if you want to bring PBL into science, why not do some things where you are actually um, using a competition? Now, you can either join the competition itself, or you can just use this competition in your class as a way to bring out a unit, OK? And so on competitions um, for middle school, National Engineer Week has something called Future City. And you actually use Sim City to, to build these cities. And there's a bunch of things on urban planning, mathematics, social studies, all these types of things. Google has an actual science fair. Cyber Patriots, this is a high school program put out by the Air Force Association. And it really, it actually teaches kids how to hack. And what a great, take all your hackers in the school, instead of actually having, you know, kicking them out of school for discipline reasons, bring them into this program and um, have them discover ways that they can do it in a productive way. The National Video Game Challenge, this is all on, um, again, the STEM institutes. The Microsoft um, Imagine Cup has some great things. DuPont. Challenge. And again, I'm going through these kind of quick, but these are all in the live binder for you. Um, what you might want to do is just write down a couple of those that you want to say, hey, I want to make sure I hit that. Uh, Moody's has an actual mega math challenge, they call it. Here's one. Who wants to be a mathematician? Okay. Um, Intel has a science talent search, which is, which is awesome. Um, and there's also a science and engineering fair that in, Intel puts out. First Robotics, and I know a lot of you are part of this with the VEX competitions, but First Robotics has some great things. And then Verizon actually has an app challenge, okay, where kids write an app. And so think, think about competitions as a way to bring STEM into your program, PBL into the program, even if you don't join the competition, okay? It may be that you found the competition and it happened two months ago, but all the resources are still up there for you. Go ahead and use that as part of it. Um, biomimicry, I think this is a great one. Got Game is another one where they're actually doing some game type things. And then the National Science Bowl, which put out by the US Department of Energy. Here's one in the elementary and middle school level. It's called the Kids Science Challenge. And there's all these different units here, like um, detective science, bio-inspired design. Okay, sports on Mars, some great things here that um, some of these competitions were done three, four years ago, but they still have them online so you can use them as part of your program. Pulse of the Planet, some great videos there on different types of environmental concerns. And of course, the Young Scientist Challenge um, has some wonderful things too. Now remember, I said 
we have to think about the humanities and the arts. And I wanted to show you a couple STEAM type ideas because I believe STEM and STEAM are so important. You see, STEAM brings back the smell of the crayon. It, it, it allows kids to tinker, to go through that iterative process, to, I don't like to call it failing forward. I like to call it um, actually just having them learn how to revise, okay? How to take a first draft and make a second draft. Um, remix and create, okay? All of those types of things. And probably one of my favorite ones is the Kennedy Center. It's called Arts Edge. Some great things on, on the actual arts in STEM education. Um, the New York Times Learning Network. Take a look at the different lesson plans there, okay, that you will find. And all of these, the New York Times has some, some awesome things. The Art Institute of Chicago. Take a look at that. Chemistry and Physics of Light. The Art and Astronomy. So that's out of Chicago. And then there's the Art Zone. This is great for younger kids just exploring and playing with art and technology. Um, let me, how, how many people here, I'd love to see in the, in the window, how many people are starting to get into the makers movement, but some of my makers ideas that I really have is, first of all, use your standards. Don't let your maker stuff fill a landfill. Let it fill your curriculum instead, okay? And I've got some whole, um, so, some whole ideas for you in articles in that um, Life Finder about how you can make a maker's movement that isn't a landfill um, contributor. Um, STEM-based, as we get into here, we have computer control, things like 3D printing, robotics, electronic toys. We also have computer wearables and programming, Raspberry Pi, Arduino, code, all of these types of things. STEM-based maker's concept, conductive ink, Putty circuits, squishy circuits. Somebody in the board here just a minute ago talked about makey-makey and some great things you can see with that. And of course, remember analog, cardboard, paper, straws, pipe cleaners. You don't have to have all of these, these fancy things as far as that. Well, you can make it happen at home, in the lab, in dedicated space, in classrooms. And so some of my favorite sites for this is DIYDoItYourself.org. Some great information you will find there. Here's one <coughs> that you may not have heard of. This was put out by Google, and they, they did it for last summer, and I'm not sure if they're doing another one this summer, but they've kept it online, and what it is is a whole curriculum that kids could do last summer in this thing called an online maker's camp. And so every one of these weeks has different lesson plans, and my thought was, why can't we just use these in the classroom? Okay? So take a look at that. This was put out by Google. Okay? And um, it looks like Paula followed it last summer. It was a great experience. So thanks for sharing that. Make Zine, of course, and you can find this in any bookstore or order it. Um, squishy Circuits. I don't know if anybody's used the Squishy Circuits, but it's got some great things as far as actually doing circuitry with um, clay. And you make this very inexpensive. Now, there's different types of circuits that you can do. There's the little bits. There's the snap circuits and the circuit scribes. And I have all three of those there. The circuit scribes is actually a pen, okay? Snap circuits is kind of interesting because I love the little bits, but if you're on a budget, you will find that you can usually get four or five of the snap circuits for about the price of um, a little bit. So it's something you might want to take a look at. If you've ever been to the Exploratorium in San Francisco, it's a wonderful place. But what's even more wonderful, visit it online. There's some great things online in their, what's called the Exploratorium Tinkering Studio. And you can, show, you can see some of the things that I talked about right there in that slide. Of course, if you've never been part of the Imagination Foundation's Global Cardboard Challenge, it happens um, every October. Kids make things out of cardboard. I actually had a teacher in my district do the challenge. It was, this was AP Language Arts, and they made a medieval gallery, video, or a game gallery of what might have existed in medieval times with this whole theme of learning about medieval history and language and stuff like that. It was very cool. Makey Makey, 
go to the site and take a look at it. This is an add-on to any computer that kids can create and make with. Um, Sphero. I don't know if anybody's played with the Sphero balls, but one of the things in Sphero, they're the little balls that you actually control with your phone, but here's the hidden secret. They've actually created a curriculum behind it that will teach coding where kids can use their computers or just cell phones to code for one of these little Spiro balls. So whenever you order one of the Spiros, make sure you get the Spark Edition. And that will come with all of these types of things, all the things that you can do with, with actually the coding. 3D printing. Uh, one of my favorite that's coming out that I've, I've had some work with is the Dremel printers. And Dremel is coming out with this whole curriculum on um, different types of things that you can do in 3D printing, which I think goes beyond just making pieces, but getting kids to think and be creative, which I think is wonderful in the area of 3D printing. PBL resources, as we got about four or five minutes to go, I promised you I would talk about a couple of them as we get into um, PBL itself or project-based learning. One of my favorites there in the um, upper left-hand corner is BIE. And you can actually go to BIE.org and you can do a resource search. You put in what you want to do and it will bring up a bunch of articles, some wonderful things. Edutopia has some great things for you that I know you will love under project-based learning. And then that one where it says 21st century, okay, the state of West Virginia has a site. And at that state of West Virginia site, you will find all different types of uh, projects. And then learning reviews is another one that is very, very, very um, valuable for getting into some PBL things. Final thoughts, PBL, STEM, technology integration. What I've tried to do is I've tried to get into the pedagogy of it in the first half and the practicality of it here in the second half. And I hope you've enjoyed these ideas on, on project-based learning. Project-based learning being the actual process. STEM being the content, okay? Technology allowing us to use it to be the connector, the conduit, the amplifier, okay? Keep all of these things in mind as you go through the STEM process, the PBL process, because remember, we have to give kids something to do, not something to learn. We've been doing that too long. And the doing is of such a nature as to demand thinking, learning naturally results. So that's really what I wanted to talk about today. Hey, I'm going to encourage all of you, thanks for spending time. Dream big. Put the three together. Make it real for kids. It has been a pleasure to present to all of you at Classroom 2.0. Um, share this, um, con connect with me anytime. You've got my Twitter, you've got my blog, you've got my email, um, all of those types of things. Thank you, thank you, thank you for allowing me to spend this hour on this Saturday with you. I know it's a lot of stuff, but that's why the live binder is there for you. Thank you so much, Mike. And it was such a whirlwind. I didn't see very many questions in the chat. If anyone does have a question for Mike, please type it in the chat and I'll ask. I know there were other great resources posted. Or that's another idea, yes, if anyone wants to take the mic to either ask a question or share an experience they've had, that would be great too. What, what I did like was I, I was just so impressed with the amount of, sh I couldn't keep up with the chat, just with the amount of sharing going on there. I, I, to me, I, I'm going to have to make sure I copy that. In, in fact, I'm, and Peggy, you might want to share that with us, is do we download the chat or how do you make a copy of the chat itself? Well, there, there is so a way to get the chat if there. you want to in the file menu inside of Collaborate, but that's one of the resources Peggy will get once the show is over. Uh, and it will be on the uh, Classroom 2.0 Live website. Yeah. It'll, she'll get the, the chat log. I, I think with a lot of you, thank you so much, Paula, 
I have a feeling I've given you enough to keep you busy for the summer, if you wish. Easily, if not more than that. <laughs> Okay, I don't see questions, so I will wrap up the show. Thanks again, Mike, for all of your wonderful sharing and, and resources. Uh, our upcoming shows are May 7th, Todd Nisloni, Adam Welcome with Kids Deserve It Initiative. On May 14th, Nate Balcom is our featured teacher. The March Book Madness and Other Student Projects. May 21st, there isn't a show, there's a 4T virtual conference, the 21st to the 23rd, and the 28th, also no show. That's the Memorial Day holiday weekend in the United States. As you exit the show, and Mike, if you wouldn't mind turning the mic off, we hear your typing. Um, as you ex exit the show, the survey link should open up. You can also take the link in the chat box soon, or the link is in the live binder. Special thanks again to Mike Gorman, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming.